In this video, we're going to continue exploring NMR or nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And we're going to look at the reasons why we use TMS, what chemical shifts are, and how we can use them to interpret NMR spectra. And then finally, we're going to take a look at some high resolution NMR spectroscopy and what sort of information that gives us about a molecule. So let's start off by revisiting. Uh, TMS or trimethylsilane and talk about the reasons why we use this particular molecule to um, normalize our scales when we're measuring chemical shifts in NMR spectra. So there are many reasons why we use this particular compound. One of the first ones is that there are 12 protons so there's three on each of these methyl groups, and they are all in the same environment. So because there are 12 protons here, it provides a really, really strong signal. So it's a very strong signal. Um, and even uh, if you have only very, very small amounts of this particular substance. So that's a great thing. You only need to add a little bit in and you get a very strong signal. And so, the chemical shift for this is also much, much lower than the protons in pretty much any other organic molecule. So it helps to fix the lower end of the scale and it doesn't overlap with any of the other protons of interest. So that is great as well. So lots of great reasons why we use TMS. Um, the last one is that it's, um, well, non-toxic, it's inert, so it doesn't react. Um, and it has a really low boiling point. So its boiling point is just slightly above room temperature, 26 to 28 degrees Celsius. And so what that means is after you're done running your sample in NMR, you can essentially just let the TMS um, evaporate off over a couple days. And then you have your sample back and ready to go to be able to do some other tests with. So it's really, really great for all of those reasons. The other thing we need to revisit are chemical shifts. Now, chemical shifts are measured for all different types of protons, and they are given in the data booklet. I believe it is table 27 um, in the data booklet. So you can take a look at this. Um, the kind of the way that you read this particular data table is that the protons that are highlighted, so bolded here, are the ones that you're looking at. So for example, if you have a proton, let's take this one here, um, that's in a methyl group and it's attached to a phenyl group, then it's going to have a chemical shift value of about 2.5 to 3.5. There is a range because it depends what else it's attached to, and we'll get into that in a few moments. Uh, so another example might be if you have protons here attached to a carbon that's attached then to another oxygen group, that can be in the 3.3 to 3.7 range. So if we go back to the example that we were looking at in our previous video, we had a proton that was attached to a carbon attached to an O, uh, which was in this sort of range here. And then the other one we need to look at is the proton attached directly to a hydroxyl group, and that's in the range of one to six. So if we go back to our example here, that one to six range is huge. So matching up the yellow proton, the one that's attached to the O, you kind of want to leave to the end. But the one that's attached in the red here to the carbon attached to the oxygen, that's given pretty specifically in the 3.3 uh, to 3.7 range. So it's going to be matched up to this particular peak here, whereas then you can match up the yellow one to the other peak showing up around too. So that's a nice way to be able to use uh, chemical shift data as well. Now, high resolution NMR spectroscopy is really neat because if we kind of take a look at these two spectrums here, the low resolutions given on the left and the high resolutions given on the right. The high resolution spectrum gives more information 
about the different peaks. And what happens is you actually start seeing some of these peaks splitting into other peaks. And you get really specific what are called splitting patterns um, that's going to result from something called spin-spin coupling. So what is exactly spin-spin coupling and how does it result in all of these kind of splitting patterns? And then what do we use it for in order to interpret these out of our spectrum? So spin-spin coupling essentially is the splitting of single absorption peaks into what are called multiplets. Uh, so it could be a singlet, a doublet, a triplet, a quartet, um, depending on how many of those uh, peaks that you see it split into. And the reason why it splits into these multiplets is due to the spin of one proton coupling with the spins of neighboring protons. So in this example here, this proton here is in one chemical environment and we get a quartet showing on a high resolution NMR spectrum. It's split into four or quartet because if we look at the adjacent uh, carbon, so we're the carbon, we're looking at this proton attached to this carbon, but if we look at the adjacent carbon, it's attached to three hydrogens on that adjacent carbon. So that's causing it to split into four peaks. If we look at the other side, this carbon here, this methyl group, is split into a doublet. And that's because on its, its adjacent carbon, there is one hydrogen attached. So in general, if there are n number of hydrogens on an adjacent atom, the signature or the signal, sorry, for that a particular proton is going to be split into n plus one peaks. So it always gets split into one more than the number of protons there is. So looking into the types of splitting patterns in a little bit more detail, generally you're only going to see a singlet, doublet, triplet, or quartet. So kind of running through each of those, um, a singlet. We say it has a multiplicity of one. Essentially, multiplicity just, just means the number of peaks. And so a singlet has one peak, and um, that means that it has zero equivalent protons on an adjacent carbon atom, right? If you have a doublet, then it has a multiplicity of two, and that means that it has one proton on its adjacent carbon. Um, if you have a triplet, multiplicity of three, and there are two equivalent protons on adjacent carbon atoms, and then for a quartet four, there are three adjacent uh, protons on um, adjacent carbon atoms. It becomes a mouthful when you start saying it. In terms of the intensity of peaks, what's really neat is that the intensities are actually given by Pascal's triangle here. If you kind of take a look at it, if it's split into just one, then its intensity is one. But if it's split into two, then its intensity is the same and it's in a one-to-one -one ratio. If it's split into three, it's a one-to-two-to-one -to -to -one ratio, right? One to two to one. And then if it's split into four, it's in a one to three to three to one ratio. So that also gives you some really helpful information here. So let's look at an example then and see how we use this particular information to figure out an NMR spectrum. Um, in this one here, the first thing we kind of want to do is we want to look at our integration trace. So we're going to take our rulers again. We're going to measure the differences in the sizes here. Um, if I did that, I got 1, 1, and then 1 1.5 and 1.5, or it's in a 2 to 3 to 3 ratio. So what that means is that there are two protons here, there are three protons shown in this peak, and then there are three protons in this peak. Okay, so that's information we already know how to get from um, 
from the previous video. Now, in terms of the splitting, we can use the splitting pattern. So this first peak here with the two ratio, it means that we have two protons in this environment and it is next to, if it's split into four, it means it's next to three protons or likely a methyl group, okay? So this is probably two protons is probably going to be an ethyl group and it's gonna be next to a methyl group. So that's actually a really good indicator that you have an ethyl. Um, if we look at the other one at the lowest end, that's a three protons, so that's probably a CH3 group. And um, it's split into three, so it's gonna be next to a CH2 group. Okay, so kind of those two peaks there, hand in hand, tell you that you've got an ethyl group somewhere. So we probably do have an ethyl group in this molecule. Okay. Um, now this third peak here, means we have a methyl group because we have three protons, but it's next to zero hydrogens. So we now kind of need to take a look at the rest of the data that we're, that we're given um, in terms of what we're given in this question. The fact that it's a C4H8O kind of tells us that um, we have, like if, if we were to do an IHD calculation, we get one. So it means there's probably a double bond somewhere in here. Um, you can do that calculation on your own and just kind of take a look at that, or it could be a ring. Um, the other thing, I guess that, well, I guess the, those are sort of the pieces of information we have. Um, one sort of thing that would fit this is if we had a ketone. So if we had a C double bond O bonded then to another methyl group. Now we could double check this and make sure that it fits within the chemical shifts that we know from our data booklet. So if we took a look at that, uh, we could look at the chemical shifts for this particular one. And if we were to look that up, uh, it's around 2.1 to 2.7. So you would be looking for the one with the hydrogen next to a, a carbonyl group um, and looking at that particular shift. And that matches up with that peak really nicely. Uh, we could look then at the ethyl group that um, we would kind of expect again, 2.1 to 2.7 range. And that one shows up around, yeah, it's about 2.4. And then finally, this last sort of one here, uh, methyl group, we're expecting around 0.9 to 1.7 based on our table. And it shows up at 1.1, so it fits that range as well. So all of these things do fit this particular compound. And so you're using all of these pieces of information to come up with the formula. So that's it then for this video. We'll see you in the next one.